to do this now? I don't know. They stayed in the motel last night, she said, and he was still there. She was going to go back and pick him up. Okay. <laughs> I'll be glad when we hear they've landed in Tucson. This has got to be a tough trip. Yeah. And I assume she's the main driver. I, I, I would assume. Only that. driver. Only yeah. driver. Yeah. But yeah. they are going to stay someplace tonight also down in Palm Springs. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I went and sat with Dean yesterday while the movers were doing their stuff for a while. Oh, and, and, yeah, amen. All right, it is six o'clock, and I welcome all y'all who've taken time out of your Wednesday nights. Uh, I don't know what it's like in the valley for those of you who are valley dwellers, but it's chilly here. <laughs> And uh, and I, I'm ready for spring. <clears throat> anyway, it's it started raining here. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, it's, yeah it's cool. supposed to rain tonight. Well, amen. Anyone want to open us in prayer? Huh. I'll do it. Well, wonderful. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but that's the fun prayer. of volunteering. <laughs> well, dear Lord, we are thankful for the rain we were just talking about and we pray that we're able to manage it and get it to where it needs to be to nurture our crops and we pray that the time we spent this evening will nurture us and get us to where we need to be amen amen thank you well, thank you all again for being here. Did anyone take me up on the offer to read uh, Philippians? Oh, you don't even have to answer it. I, oh, there are some people. Thank I did. I did. Yeah. I read, I read it, it out loud. <laughs> and, and, and having, for those of you who read it aloud, uh, did you experience anything in reading the fullness of the letter uh, aloud, like that idea of audibly hearing it? Um, yeah. Yes. I think it's the first time I've ever gone front to back all in one reading. And that was, that was eye-opening. Also, so. a loving Paul is, even oh, yeah. he himself is going through so much. Right. And how encouraging he is. He, I think yeah. he knows that He's never going to see these guys in person again. Only he understands how important it is to continue to shore them up. Yes. Mm. But kind of at the same time, prepare them for the eventuality that what's going to happen. Amen. A little Amen. bit of heresy almost, but uh, I almost think we need a scroll of Philippians and we can start a whole new church <laughs> just based on his. Uh, philosophy and his love. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's true. Well, and if At you least... bother to read any of the other letters all the way through, you will know that this particular letter of Paul is unique in his love. Um, Galatians, if you want to read something where Paul's not unique in his love, read Galatians aloud. He's unique in his fury there. If you want to read Paul just angry uh, and, and, and bitter, read 1 Corinthians all the way through. And if you think 1 Corinthians 13 is beautiful because it is, you'll realize that that's Paul telling them what love is. And everything he'd said for the first 12 chapters, he said they were the opposite. So it's Paul like, oh, oh. Anyway, uh, Grace, your hand is raised up. It's very uh, interesting. No, did you have something to say? I, I did. I'm, I'm not a good jumper in or on conversations. That's why I put my hand up. Anyhow, <laughs> um, it, and I was wondering why you asked us to read it out loud. However, without knowing that, um, I found that I always thought Philippians was basically think about good things. And when I read it out loud, I, I realized that the Philippians that I had underlined um, had so much more to it. And then I thought to myself, gosh, am I a lazy person not to read the Bible out loud? Because I obviously missed a lot by not reading it out loud. And, and Pastor Garrett, I don't know if that was your point. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing 
uh, why you wanted us to do that. Because for me, it made me realize that maybe I was like a lazy Bible reader. And if I read it out loud, I'd find more in it than I thought I knew. So I assure you, Grace, that was not comment. my intention to make you feel like you're a lazy <laughs> Bible reader. Um, yeah. I, I, my only intention was to help us experience the letter the way that those who were to initially receive it experienced it. So that we have more of a flavor, if you will, of what its intention was, what its purpose was, how it was 2,000 years ago for people as opposed to especially a letter like Philippians that is beloved by the Christian community. Um, everybody loves Philippians. I, I mean, again, we were talking about quotes you can just pull right out of Philippians that people have. Um, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I, I thank my God every time I think of you. Like there are some of the greatest lines of Holy Scripture that are in a letter that Paul wrote that he had no intentions of making Scripture. And my hope was that you would hear it read aloud and have a, a better sense of what it really is. It's not devotional. It wasn't meant as Scripture. Uh, it is certainly worshipful. And, and were you able in the midst of reading any of it to hear like the worship service that Paul's obviously participating in himself in a help, in a, in a hope, I believe, that those who read it or hear it read to them um, have that same kind of sense of worship? Um, he kind of sounded like you. He, he kind of sounded like a, <laughs> like a preacher. And he is, and um, and uh, like me, I, I who knows. I, well, I mean, you know, like you, like you're a preacher. Amen. <laughs> well, he's certainly he's certainly a, a pastoral, and and we'll talk a little bit about that today. But we are going to read the first eleven verses, and and if you're if you're one of those people who sometimes thinks to yourself, boy, how long do you think we can take to go through a four chapter book of the Bible? I don't think that anymore. <laughs> oh, um, I have I have 31 slides for 11 verses today and uh, we'll see what happens um, but uh, let's read it and we're gonna we're gonna read it in two little chunks the first one just the first two verses will anybody read the first two verses of the letter of Paul to the Philippians I will thank you Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Does that sound familiar if you're familiar with Paul's letters at all? Yeah. Yes. And, and what are some things you notice right away? And, and the reason I'm going to ask you this question is because you will find it shocking how long I can talk about these two verses. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's writing it along with Timothy, not just himself. And yeah, while he's writing it himself, um, he, he's also having that piece. And have you noticed any other Pauline letters um, that uh, he, start, he includes others uh, who are with him? that he's doing that with. And so, and I'll just say, yes, you have. And if you have yes. it now, yeah, thank you, Bill. <laughs> and uh, and um, in, the midst, in the midst of that, um, why might Paul, even if he's writing a personal letter that Timothy probably is, is not in, because in verse three, he immediately uses the first person singular. So he's writing this by himself. Why does he include Timothy, might you think? Because he's sending Timothy back to them. And we're going to find be, that and you And you read that. You find that out a little bit later, don't you? Yeah. And, uh, and so he's, he's certainly doing, uh, sending Timothy back to them. And, with uh, his yeah. letter. With his letter, right? Uh, maybe, oh. maybe not. Okay. Now, I mean, and there's so many things that we want obvious answers to, and, and I don't have them to give to And we will never find out. No, and so like great is the mystery of faith. Um, any other reasons why he might be including other people, in this case, Timothy? 
based on your reasoning why we should read this out loud, that's kind of not only an introductory a salutation, but kind of drawing people into him to listen. Uh, the idea of drawing people into him to listen is good. I'd say amen. And, and having that kind of peace. Grace, your hand is raised. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I, you know, I, I wonder if um, he's uh, thinking that he may be uh, dead soon. I mean, they might be killing him soon. So he's, he's paving the way for someone that, that if they take him away and, and crucify him, um, there's, there's somebody there that can carry the message and have his uh, blessing. Uh, so, amen. So whether this is, is, is getting them ready for Timothy to come or, or um, inviting Timothy into his ministry or preparing them for life without him, um, the one common element that each one of you has in this is that Paul does not do his ministry alone. And that's important. Because neither should any of us and he does that right away and uh, yeah and so here we go and, and and we can say more but we will say more and let's actually finish the first 11 verses before i, I start going crazy since apparently i just got stuck on paul and timothy um which is the first three words of <laughs> chapter one verse one so let's let's do a little bit better here and, and finish it up so i can pretend that we'll finish 11 verses today anyone want to read verse three all the way through verse 11 uh, i will thank you um i thank my god every time i remember you in all my prayers for all of you i always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. Did anyone's version read substantially different to different in ways that might actually give it different meanings? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the message. So it's, it's the same, but it sounds a little different. And in, um, I guess it's maybe 10, it says, learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere, intelligent, and not sentimental gush. Mm -hmm. um, no. <laughs> well, Amen. Of, how, much, how much Christian love seems like sentimental gush anyway? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, and, and my, my version reads different pieces of time and well. And so we get to play with a lot of things today. And part of what we were going to be playing with is a Greek syntax, because I know how much all of you wanted to hear about Greek syntax when you got on the Bible study today. Um, on a side note, does anyone know if Kathy Brady is out of town or something like that? I didn't see her on Kathy Sunday Brady's either. out of town. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I, 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 it's amazing how if someone's face doesn't show up for two things I expect them in, I get nervous. So that's the same for all of you, by the way. Nice thing about smaller churches. Anyhow, let's talk about this right now. And we're going to start with Paul greets the church and its leaders. Now, again, according to the custom of his day, as we talked about last week, and quite unlike our own in some respects, so Paul uses a threefold salutation. 
There is his signature, and that's the Paul and Timothy kind of piece, and they're servants of Christ Jesus. And then his address, who's he, who's he addressing all these things to? And, and that's the to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, and a greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, however, much like our own correspondence these days, the signature reveals a great deal about the mood. And what do I mean by the signature reveals a great deal about the mood? Yeah, can you tell when you receive a letter or an email or something just based off that first kind of thing, or if the signature might be at the bottom, um, what kind of letter you're getting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm, sure. Yeah, if you get a letter to, that says to whom it may concern, <laughs> you have an idea of what to expect. If you get a letter that says uh, this was handed to you by courier and now it's like part of legal, you have an idea of what this might happen. If you get one that says, my dearest friend, you have an idea of what you might expect. And so it, it reveals a great deal about the mood, the purpose, the content of the letter, as well as the relationship between the writer and the reader. And um, that's one of those things that sometimes, again, we, we can skip right by the introductions that Paul has in his letters because we don't think they're important. But his, his salutations at the beginning immediately reveal something about what the rest of that letter is going to say. Now, one can look at a signature and determine if a letter is formal or informal, official or casual, between friends or strangers. Paul's signatures are no less revealing and the reader of Paul's letters should pause to savor them. And Grace, that's another reason I asked y'all to read it aloud if you were willing, because I, I, it's such a beautiful thing. You get to pause and savor the whole letter. Yeah, yeah. Now his, uh, his lengthy uh, signature with six verses here as some say, so it's kind of uh, keeps on going through some of the Thanksgiving. Uh, with full credentials in the Roman letter. Oh, no, this is Rome. I'm, the letter of the Romans I'm talking about. So he has a full lengthy signature in Romans. And, and in Romans, the reader, Paul's writing to strangers. And, and it, in, in, the, there, in Galatians, there's a cold and official signature that announces tension immediately. Whereas the warmly emotional signature and Philemon alerts the reader that Paul will be using the relationship as grounds to ask for a favor. Now here in Philippians, the absence of Paul's usual credentials about how he's an apostle of Christ Jesus says that his relationship with the readers makes that unnecessary. They don't need him defending his apostleship. But neither does Paul permit his affection for the Philippians to substitute for the central subject matter, which for him, is the gospel. You can tell Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. In the first three, two verses, he three times mentions Christ. And so you know that he's, he's focused on that as well. Um, and being friends of the pastor yeah, is not to be equated with the church here, but he's certainly speaking of the church. So he's not just writing to friends, even though he's friendly with them. He's writing to the church. Now, he prefers to sign his name, Paul, a servant. But again, the word there, and does anyone have um, one of those little uh, letters or numbers that gives you a footnote down below where, where it says servants of Christ Jesus? And then it might tell you the Greek means slaves. Slaves, yeah. Yeah, we just don't like the term slaves. And so, so many of our English translations have ridded us of slaves. But what is the difference between a servant and a slave? And how might Paul experience being a slave of Christ? And that means something more to him. You're serving the master. Amen. Like you are owned by this one. You have nothing left of yourself. Um, you're you're not a hired. Like a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so he says, yes, this Paul, a servant or slave of Christ Jesus, and that flavoring of his servanthood or his slavehood uh, is in the entire letter. For he will call upon the Philippians themselves to be servants of one another, just as Christ himself took the form of a servant. We'll see that in chapter two, verse seven. 
here is elsewhere, Paul adds to his name that of an associated ministry, like we've talked about. And, and this does not mean that Timothy co-authored the letter, right? Paul writes in the first person singular, but Paul always worked as a part of a team. And, and, and still, as we ponder ways to get out of church, because sometimes we can't stand each other or whatever else, um, the joy of being together is that we can do more together than we can apart. And Paul knew this as well. Uh, Timothy was not only well known to the church at Philippi, having been with Paul at its founding and having visited there more than once, and we see that in Acts 16 and 19, but he was soon to be sent to Philippi as Paul's emissary, as uh, Claudia told us while talking about system. The letter is to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now, the term saints or holy ones refers primarily to God's act of claiming them as God's people, consecrated and bound in covenant. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll ask you, what do I mean by that? When, he, when, when Paul calls everybody saints, that God is like, and this is God's action, well, what does that mean to you? We are chosen by him. There's a sense of chosenness that comes with the term saints. When we hear the word saints, what do we normally think of immediately? Catholic Church. Catholic Church. <laughs> Mother Teresa. <laughs> Mother Teresa. <laughs> Saint people. Person. Or those who have gone before. Or sometimes those who have gone before. And we think they're um, dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, well, I wish I'd talked to you guys with that question before I wrote that next part that was talking about how we often talk about the moral character. So when someone finally said Mother Teresa, it's like, well, that's what I was looking for. Um, but nevertheless, I think those other answers are brilliant. And, um, and in the midst of all of that, though, Paul was just talking to them. So it would be like me getting in front of the church and saying to all you saints, and then maybe be like, is he talking about me? And yes, to all of you. And I, I don't do that often in church, but I noticed um, in my time in the African-American church that I would often go to other churches when I was like guest preaching, as even an intern. And uh, I would say, and I bring greetings from all the saints at Sojourner Truth Presbyterian Church. And I did the same thing as I continued to move on in others. And I bring greeting from all the saints. Um, that's just you because God chose you. Now, Paul knew perhaps that we, will very easily let grace de degenerate into sentimental acceptance without moral earnestness. So we still do need the moral earnestness when he says saints. And that idea of saint not only means that you're chosen, but that you're chosen to act like one. Now, Paul gives the saints two addresses, uh, in Christ Jesus and in Philippi. And he'll elaborate upon this double designation later when he calls them to let their life in Christ Jesus be evident in their life in Philippi. And he talks about that in chapter two. And, and Paul will not let them forget, as though if they ever could, that they had been called to be God's people in that time and in that place. So again, when we read this letter, very often we'll be like, oh, this, this is speaking right to me. No, he was talking to a people at a particular time in a particular place. But what is common for all who've read this letter since is we could take out in Philippi and we could say in Napoma or in Bakersfield or, or in Thousand Oaks. And again, uh, I, is there anyone, Guadalupe, I, I don't know where you all are. I think I've done a decent enough job. Um, <laughs> and if you were to hear that you are this saint, but in Christ Jesus, in wherever you are, what does now that mean to you? If, if I'm to read this, like, hey, Paul wrote us a letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus. In California. It's a recognition that he sees Christ in us and what we're doing. And amen. And it means that where we are is important. And, and what Christ is doing through us and with us, that's what makes us a saint. This is all great. Yes. And, and, and that's a beautiful piece. Um, th this is great. I'm, I'm a little mixed up here. Because I'm hearing two things about saints. Saints as um, being chosen to follow Jesus and um, the way you put it so well. And then my understanding, again, being Catholic, when you think of a saint, someone that's being 
recognized after they're dead for having done miracles. So, so can you clarify, maybe just say it again for me, what is a saint? I, I heard one old fellow once Grace, tell me, Grace, a saint you're a saint. Or you, or, you, or you ain't. That's the way he put it. You're, you're a saint. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know what that means. Um, uh -huh. I, you're a saint. You know, when we, well, I, I think that we denigrate what we do as Christians. Um, I know that I am old enough, I guess, to have experienced someone coming up to me from years ago and saying something to me about how much something I did meant to them. Amen. And, and, and I, I can't even remember uh, doing it. And it was certainly not anything I was thinking was saint-like at the time. But mm -hmm. to that person, that was a miracle. Like, like saintly. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, I'm getting it. Okay. And, and, and so that's how Paul's using it, both as that saintly way, but it's also because God chose them. They're saints because of God choosing them, not because they themselves have turned themselves into saints. No, and not and, because what I meant by that is, is that obviously oh, God worked through me. I didn't even realize that. Uh -huh. Oh, amen. And I wasn't denigrating at all what you said. I think that is, in fact, saintly. And that's part of his double meaning of saint here. And I apologize if it came across that way. It's no. both the chosenness now and the doing of what you're supposed to do in Christ Jesus in the place you are. Your ministry, sure. your oh. call is exactly where you are right now. It doesn't matter if you like it. It doesn't matter if you want to move. That's where you are. Yeah. And you are a saint in Christ Jesus in this time and in this place, right where you are. Wow. You well, are in the mission field. <laughs> yes, you are the mission field. I, the yeah. sign that says you're now yeah. entering the mission field, that's in. lovely. But wherever you are is the mission field. And, and the Catholic Church names people saint after people do miracles in their names. Right. After their death. Uh, as if they're answering prayers. And, and that has nothing to do with anything in the Bible, which doesn't mean that it's not beautiful. I love it. Um, I would say that many of those who call upon the names of saints and see miracles done are probably themselves saints, huh. but don't know how to give themselves the credit. Um, <laughs> But who am I, and I'm no Catholic, and I do not understand uh, Catholicism with regards to that, and I don't mean that again negatively, I just don't literally understand it, because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not my tradition. I think being part of saintly is not caring about getting credit for what you've done. Amen to that. Did Mother Teresa care about what she did? No, she just did the right thing. Huh. And she and she did. And like, and, and there you go. And, and, and you know what, I it is, it is almost halfway through our time. And we're still talking about <laughs> verse one, I want yeah. you to know that we're not getting through 11 verses today. <laughs> and, ignore, and I'm, ignore me. Ignore my hands. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. It's part of the thing. Um, I was about to tell you, okay. um, some of the background of Philippi. And I'm still going to tell you because maybe you're curious, even though there's the part of me that wants to rush right through it. No, don't rush. We don't. Yeah. No. <laughs> we have another Thank couple you. of months. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. And we'll see how many people decide to not like when we're in year three of Philippians. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Philippi was in a really strategic place for the whole Christian mission. It was, it was an important city. So he didn't just write to the Philippians um, saying the center of your ministry, but he also knew its importance. It was located on what they called the Ignatian Way, nine miles from the port of Neapolis, um, which huge port in the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, Philippi witnessed daily the traffic of commerce and culture and religion between the Eastern world and the Western world. Now, it was Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, who had rebuilt the town 
and I don't know how to pronounce Kennedy's, I think, but I'm not I'm not going to say it again, and had given it his own name, Philip. So Philip named it Philippi. So again, it's amazing how many places you can go in the ancient world that are named after his son as well. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, initially, that city had flourished because of gold mines that were nearby. But by the time of Paul, they, they were gone as well. Um, it now was flourishing as a Roman colony. Uh, it was both favored by Mark Antony and Octavius following their victory over the armies of Brutus and Cassius. Um, assassins of Julius Caesar, I misspelled Caesar, but that's fine, um, on the plains of Philippi in 42 BC. Now, Antony settled some of his soldiers there and Octavius, who was later Caesar Augustus, um, he ended up relocating Italian families there soon after in 30 BC. So this is when it becomes even more prominent. Now, at Paul's writing, Philippi is now a Roman colony, an administrative center of the empire, whose proud inhabitants are Roman citizens, and whose official language is Latin. Now, Luke provides the only account we have of the beginning of the Christian mission there. Um, Paul doesn't really reference anything about it. He does reference it in a different letter about how it's hard, and we'll get to that later. Um, but Acts 16 talks about the beginning there. And if you don't remember Acts 16 off the top of your head, because you're one of those people who doesn't remember everything, or hey, Acts has been a long time since so bothered with anything. And sometimes Acts is weird. So you don't read it. Maybe we should do Acts sometime. Anyway, neither here nor there. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was in response to a vision that Paul had with a call that said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then Paul and his companions made a slow like start at a riverside place of prayer. And he encountered a woman there named Lydia and some others, um, but difficulties mounted. And they were victimized by a local anti-Semitism. Isn't it fascinating that in the Bible, um, you just hear about local anti-Semitism. <laughs> And then we still read about it in the newspapers 2,000 years later. Oh. oh, and so Paul and his companions were charged with civil disobedience. And Paul and Silas got to endure beatings and imprisonment. And as far as we know, this is the first time that Paul came up against the Roman Empire. At least it is in the book of Acts. He remembered in a letter to the Thessalonians how he had, quote, suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi. So it was a prominent city that Paul had a hard start in. Now, now according, you know, yeah. So actually, he suffered because they thought he was Jew, a Jew. He was a Jew. He was a Jew. Well, he was a Jew at first, but of course, but he was. But they they weren't reacting to him being a Christian. Um. <clears throat> No, I mean, although they could have been reacting to some of what he said in that way as well. I am um, uh, early Christianity is a form of Judaism. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, and, I realize uh, so, but and so yeah. maybe I maybe I should look at that better. But I'm going with my anti-Semite uh, voice, even if it doesn't okay. appear that way when we read that. Thank you for questioning that, um, though, Claudia. Is Philippi like modern day Skopje in Macedonia? I have no idea. Okay. I was just curious, sorry. No, don't be sorry. I love when I like, and I can't even, like when I was younger, I'd make up the answer. Um, I got <laughs> older and, and I don't, but I, I like when <laughs> questions. Anyway, any more because the one thing about me being on the screen is I actually can't see your faces during some of this. So like, I just keep going. <laughs> You're supposed to know everything. <laughs> I know, I, I know that sounds like your voice. And, and, uh, <laughs> no, I, I learned a long time ago that I, I will never know everything. And um, now I'm just trying to make believe. Anyway, um, we there, know that- you can Paul see my face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there he is. <laughs> I think we're having too much fun for the Bible. Well, we, we've learned to interrupt you. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I, brilliant. Okay, so according to Luke, Paul made at least two other visits to Philippi. Um, and we, we hear that in Acts 20. 
Um, but the political and the social climate apparently did not improve for Paul while he was there. In fact, the church at the time of this letter is, quote, engaged in the same conflict which you saw and now hear to be mine. Um, something is going on in Philippi. Most likely the common agony helped forge the bonds holding Paul and this church together. Um, now you might think that's strange, the common agony holding people together. Do you have friends that you went through common agony with and because of that common agony, you have the bonds of friendship that will never be broken? Absolutely. Yeah, have you ever noticed how many people still spend time with their fraternity brothers, their sorority sisters? Like, you go through the hell of some of what that is, and I guess you stay friends long. Um, how often do people who were in war stay friends together afterward? There is something about a common suffering that brings people together, mm -hmm. and perhaps that's part of the reason that compassion means yeah, to please. suffer with. <laughs> now, singled out for special mention in addressing all the saints or bishops and deacons. No definite, definite articles are used in the Greek for that. And this reference is notable, noticeable in its singularity in Paul's letters. Now, this is me telling you information that you may not want to know, but is interesting to me. And so because he doesn't mention deacons or uh, bishops as offices in any other letter, coupled with the common assumption that such offices were yet a generation or two from appearing in the church. Oh. Uh, this, this has convinced many scholars to regard the phrase as an editorial addition at the time uh. Paul's letters were being gathered and granted wider mm. authority in the church. Mm. Yeah. Now such certainty or such certainly may have been the case, but original or editorial, the reference is not to what we call the ecclesiastical positions of bishops and deacons today. Oh, that was a letter designation. The terms are now clerical, were in that culture quite common, to be honest. Um, bishop was referring to an overseer or a superintendent, and deacon meant servant or attendant. Um, so deacon was a common term for a servant, for, not from a servant. And uh, an overseer could be a state or a local official or a leader of a guild. As such, these persons were responsible for collecting, managing, and distributing taxes or other monies. It is practically impossible to document the evolution of church order. I mean that. If you want to know why we have all the offices we have now, we will tell you they all come from scripture because we believe it. But we have no idea how they happened historically, really. Like... We have some pieces, but it's practically impossible. But it's quite possible that some persons in the church at Philippi functioned in such a capacity as having an overseer role or a serving role. After all, a prominent feature of Paul's relation to this church is their gifts to him, their repeated support for his mission, and their generous offerings for the famine victims among the Christians of Judea. And we see that the Philippians had done that in 2 Corinthians. Now, Paul's greeting to the church's grace and peace has become almost as familiar as his name. If we were to write a, a Paul's letter to like the Church of America or our church or whatever church, uh, we would all say like, I, Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus. And to like, but we all know then he would say at some point in time, and grace and peace to you from God, our father and whatever else he wanted to say. The double greeting was a compound derived from his heritage as a Jew and his mission as an apostle to the Gentiles. Peace, shalom, reminded Paul that his gospel had been promised through the prophets and Holy Scripture, and that for all his battles with legalistic distortions of Judaism, Paul was still an Israelite, and in Romans, he claims such. Grace, which is a word, I, I, I don't know how to say the word in, in Greek, um, charis, I think, but don't listen to me, uh, was a Christian, uh, Christianized modification of the common Hellenistic greeting, which I'm not going to pronounce either, but hopefully you can see grace here um, in this word right here. Like they're taking over some things Paul is and, and using them in new ways. And I, uh, I doubt these two things, however, as he wrote them, ever became common for him. 
After all, Paul's earlier zealous persecution defense of his Jewish tradition and his violent persecution of the group that in the name of Jesus said grace upon all without distinction of Jew or Gentile never faded from his memory. If you are someone who hated this Christ in church and yet in it found pure and complete acceptance that you wanted all to know, I think when you say grace and peace to you, you mean it in ways that are absolutely true. In person. It was this past which made his blessing of grace and peace a miracle every time he said it. Or for that matter, every time anyone says it. Given the sinful conditions that determine our granting or withholding a blessing for any of us to desire God's unmerited favor upon the upon other persons is certainly due to the presence in us of a God who sends sun and rain upon good and evil alike, and who's kind to even the ungrateful and selfish. And Paul knew that. What time is it now? Okay. That's the first two verses. Any other questions before I move us right along? Just a little aside. Yes. Um, you know how Google sometimes fills in your sentences when you don't want it to? Every time I sign my name, Grace, it adds, and peace. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I have to keep erasing it, but maybe I'll keep it there. <laughs> what? Yeah. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I'm really glad you told me, and I don't know if it's weird or not, but I think it's wonderful. Um, okay. You know, use it in a word or a sentence. Yeah. I I mean, and it was a, it was a wonderful exclamation point to me, literally tearing up and having to take a moment as I just talked about it. Peace and peace. It's, it's beautiful. It is a miracle. Yeah, too. good old Google. <laughs> and yes, Paul's introduction in two verses can make me tear up in this letter. And yeah. that's, a, uh, I mean, I know, I know I'm an easy crier, but like, don't skip over the beginning. Well, we feel it. We feel it, Pastor Garrett. Oh, <laughs> bless you. Um, now, the next part. I'm going to say is Paul is grateful for his relationship with the church. And I hope that as it was read, we all experienced that he was obviously grateful. Um, it's a literary unit. It's apparent both in content form and uh, this pat content and form. This passage is distinct from the verses which precede it and follow it. This is his Thanksgiving. In addition, it has its own identity in what is now commonly referred to as the Pauline Thanksgiving. People love this section so much, they've pulled it out of context to call it the Pauline Thanksgiving, and that doesn't bother me at all, despite what my last sermon said. Um, <laughs> because, it, because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's beautiful on its own. Um, that the expression of his thanks is confined to verses three to six is not any of reason to limit the Pauline Thanksgiving of Philippians to those four verses. As we said last week, Paul modified the Thanksgiving formula common to his letters of his time to include not only a statement of gratitude for his readers, but he had autobiographical items, a summary of matters to be discussed, implicit or explicit exhortations, and an eschatological reference. Now, I have I asked about eschatological when I said that last year and I rem or last year last week, and I recall that when Melinda graduated from seminary, she told me that she wanted to use the word eschatological at least once a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, it it basically means the end of time or the study of the end of time. Were you able to see those end of time references? It anything that we read from Paul before I, I move on. Well, he's always looking forward to Christ returning. Uh, yeah, and, and whether that's the returning piece there um, or, or whatever he's calling the day of Christ, where that is the return or the resurrection of the dead or the last judgment or whatever, 
he twice mentions in these verses the day of Christ's coming. And so well done. And I and and so we, we can see that. That's still a part of his thinking. Yeah. If this Thanksgiving seems a bit long for a brief letter, one only has to read Paul's other letters to the Macedonian church. First Thessalonians to discover that Thanksgiving can be more than one half of the entire letter. And in First Thessalonians, it's about a half of letter where he's just thanking. Um, being satisfied about the unity here, it remains our task to discern any internal pattern to the passage which would aid hearers, not readers, uh, because they heard it, to grasp and hold in mind the contents. The Thanksgiving here is a threefold structure, which may be viewed in either of two ways. In content, there is the expression of gratitude, verses three through six, the expression of Paul's affection for them, seven and eight, and the expression of a prayer for the church. And so some want to break this down as an expression of, of gratitude. Um, in terms of movement, however, and, 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 and not, I mean, not an expression of gratitude, the content is gratitude, but movement. Um, and if you're listening, to it being read you're you don't get to have it read or you're not reading it yourself but you're hearing it and and if he starts with it like this it could be viewed in relationship to the philippians that he's had in the past in the present and in the future hmm. now our comments on the text will follow this latter perspective because it maintains the centrality of the writer-reader relationship and because it does not give the impression, as does the former analysis, that Thanksgiving, participation, and petition are distinctly separate categories in Paul's joyful reflection because I, I don't think they are. So we're going to say the past first. How has it been between Paul and the Philippians? To begin with, a word of thanksgiving was not unusual for any correspondent of that day, but for Paul, it was theologically central and essential. Having expressed the blessing of God's grace in the greeting, the clear responding word was thanks. Now, can you, in any of our words for thanks, see grace in the word? Like, you can see a root between grace and a word for thanks. Yeah, like God's here. I didn't hear that, but gracias. yes, Gra yeah. gracias, obviously, yes, it means grace, and we even, in our word gratitude, right. still have a, a part of yeah. that, Yeah, and, and so, like, having given grace, the clear responding word was thanks, now, we can see a little bit of that, and I give, but, like, the word in, there again is the word in Greek, oh, and I'm just moving that, caresses, and now Eucharisto, you all know, if you say Eucharist, but Eucharisto in that is the exact word for grace. And, and that's Paul. No, go for it. Doesn't the word gratis also mean free? Um, I don't know Latin. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Or is that Greek? That's it's in Greek. Spanish, free. Gratis well, means free. Thank you, gratis. Ray. Thanks. Yeah. Free in French, gratuit. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. Was that Bruce? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we've gotten lessons. I am. I. I am. I. I don't know anything, and that's wonderful. Okay. Um. But yes. Yeah, so in yeah. so many languages, grace and gratitude go together. And Paul actually uses the same word for grace and gratitude, at least in 2 Corinthians there. Now, if the action is from God to us, that being grace, the translators render it grace in the English. And if it's from us to God, when they see Paul use the exact same word grace here, um, we call it gratitude in the English. But he is using the same word. And so there's this grace that goes back and forth between his thanksgiving. I give thanks to God. So he says all of these blessings and he gives the same exact thing back to God. Have you ever wondered when people say, Lord, we bless you, how you can possibly bless God? Yeah. You yeah. thank God. Yeah. 
So this idea that Paul's trying to get to right away with his gratitude is that giving and receiving are really so much alike that one word can define both. Mm -hmm. And gratitude is giving grace for having received grace. Mm. Gracias, yes, wonderful. Mm. That for which Paul is grateful is twofold, stated in parallel phrases, his remembrance of them, verse three, and his partnership or their partnership in the gospel, verse five. Now, actually the Greek can be translated, all my remembrance of you. Did anyone have a translation that said all my remembrance of you? Uh -uh. Or uh, all your remembrance of me, I mean, where it says, uh, I'm in verse three. Let me try again. Um, my version says, I thank my God. Oh, wait, I need to make sure. Yeah, all my remembrance of you is five. Um, every time it says, every time I remember you. Right. That's every time, it. does anyone have it where they're saying, anyone, every time you remember me? No. Great then I'm not going to talk about this <laughs> because there are some translations of the Bible that have it that way. Um, I don't know if I can actually do that because there's, I'm just going to tell you this because it's good to know. Um, some Bible translations have all your remembrance of me and in that rendering, Paul would have clearly in mind their gifts to him and while that fact and their relationship is embedded in the words partnership and partakers, they have indeed, you know, he's, he's received these things and he talks about it. Um, but the entire orientation of this passage makes all my remembrance of you more appropriate. Here. All, every time I think of you. And doesn't that immediately sound beautiful to you? Every time I think of you, I thank my God. Yeah. It's like, a, like and, a love letter and so it's not like this idea that um it's every time they think of him he thanks his god and thanks be to god because it's his legacy as a jew to survive and even flourish in painful difficulties by remembering abraham the exodus the temple and the promises paul already knew before conversion that being a believer is to a large extent an act of memory hmm. it still is and some early Christians understood when they referred to being lost in the world as having amnesia. Some of the early Christians, when they realized that they were no longer close to Christ, they were saying, I have amnesia. Hmm. I've forgotten who I am. And secondly, Paul is thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. From the time of his arrival in Philippi, Paul experienced the, faith, the faithful as participants, partners, partakers, and sharers. The word koinonia, have you heard it before? Yes. Yeah, yeah because it's a, it is a beautiful word. Um, to have in common is kind of what it means. It's, very, it's variously translated according to what is being shared. Money or, or uh, suffering, work or grace. Every time he says anything about how they're sharing these things in common, he uses the word koinonia. Its frequency in the letter is in those verses 5, 7, 2, 1, 3, 10, and 4, 14. And it testifies to the full identification of the Philippians with Paul's message and mission. Now, our common translation of this rich New Testament word koinonia is fellowship. And the reason I think you're beginning to know the word koinonia is because fellowship has been a much overused and misused word that doesn't carry as much weight anymore. For church today to announce a meeting for the purpose of fellowship is in essence to promise all that are attending that there's not going to be any serious business. We're not going to worship. There's not going to be any work. Just come and fellowship with us. For Paul, koinonia was everything. The fellowship was in everything. And given the degeneration of language, one has to say something different in order to mean the same thing. And so maybe we should just remember what koinonia meant to Paul. In the subunit verses three through six, verse four is actually parenthetical. Are we only in verse four? <laughs> okay, just take your time. <laughs> I'm not rushing. 
I'm yeah. just a little surprised. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Four is parenthetical. So he says, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. It's like he does it off to the aside. And one wonders why Paul separates the two matters for which he's grateful with a note to the effect that he always prays for all of them with joy. And the impression is that the relationship between Paul and the Philippians, strong and beautiful as it was, is suffering from some nagging minority report. Have you ever thought everything was rosy only to hear someone tell or someone tell you that it's not, that some people are unhappy with you? <laughs> yeah. And if you ever want to know what it feels like all the time, be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's what Paul always experiences. Oh. which is why he's always having to say things that he might just be trying to fix something. So what in the parathetical comment is to be underscored? It could be the word all. Maybe we should underscore all because he uses it. And that is Paul prays for all of them. Not a favored few. Paul certainly uses all noticeably here too in verse four, seven, seven again, eight, and later comments reflect some tension and disunity. We hear that in the letter. Did you notice that as you were reading it aloud? Yeah. yeah. There's pieces of it. Or but, maybe the key word is joy. It's common to refer to Philippians as the epistle of joy. But one does wonder why the word occurs so very frequently in the book. It, there are tons. Perhaps we are unduly suspicious of writers and speakers who say some words too often. Joy, joy, joy. So <laughs> here it may be a simple matter is trying to assure close friends who are heavy with the news of Paul's imprisonment that being in prison and facing death have not robbed him of joy. Mm -hmm. If you were in prison and probably facing death, what would most of the people that you loved be thinking? Not that you were joyful. <laughs> and if they were losing joy, if they believe, as I do, and, and maybe when you read it aloud, you do, that Paul is truly and sincerely joyful in this letter, what might you be inspired to embrace yourself? Yes. Joy. Now, just as Paul began in verse 3 with thanks to God, he now comes full circle in verse 6 to look beyond the Philippians and himself to the God whose own good work, the church, is including both Paul and the Philippians. Paul's confidence is expressed with his characteristic symmetry. He has a lot. The one who started the work of grace in Philippi will not abandon it in a state of incompleteness. And isn't that beautiful? Yes. God will complete. God will finish. God will bring to fulfillment. God will perfect that work that God is doing on the day of Christ Jesus. This eschatological reference to the day of Christ reoccurs at verse 10. And at that point, we'll draw a more detailed attention to it. But that's not right now. And I could go into the present, but we are two minutes away. And I still have a bit. Unless, of course, I have no idea, but I, I, we, we would go another 45 minutes and I'm not doing that to end with you, so bless your souls. <laughs> and that's the first six verses of <laughs> Philippians. We've done this for two weeks. You've got an introduction in six verses. Wow. Yeah, we're but zooming right along. <laughs> we don't zoom. And... I can't zoom because, well, we're zooming. Yes, we are. Um, I, I, I love it. It's so magnificent, every single word. And I've thrown us through some of the worst things and we did that slowly, but this is short. And I, you know, when you have something that's a meal that's a little bit smaller and you know it's delicious and so you eat it slowly. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. So thank you for eating Philippians slowly with me, at least for now. If you're bored in five years when we're finally at chapter four, I understand. Um, I'm kidding. It, uh, it'll go quicker at points in time as well. Um, but thank you for participating. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I, we've got to remember, like, like when we think of Revelations, as the letter to encourage the churches who are suffering that Paul recognizes that I think uh, what struck me in just the last things we were looking at, Paul really recognized that they were probably suffering as well. Maybe they weren't sentenced to death at this point, but they were suffering. And so it was an exhortation not only to be joyful because he was joyful for him, but be joyful in the suffering that they were themselves experiencing different from his. So, well, and amen. And, and, and whether it's uh, reasons that we discern or not all and joy um, that he includes all so desperately and so brilliantly highlights joy is a blessing. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, okay, so uh, next week, we'll uh, at least finish up till verse 11. <laughs> okay. I think so. And, um, and, and we might even take a bigger chunk. Who knows? It's all good. Um, if you have any questions though or anything, let me know. And uh, thank you all for joining me. Let's pray. God, even when I decide to not finish the whole thing and, and stop midway, and it's two minutes early, we still go over the hour. <laughs> and I hope that the reason that these people do this with you and with me is the same reason that I do. Because I just love our time together. Lord, thank you for allowing whatever dear souls preserved this beautiful letter. And thank you for letting us read it. And may we learn about it while being inspired by it as I have been today. Every other day we look at it. Thank you for all these dear souls. Now, may we have great joy and great love no matter what we're going through because we still get to have you and we get to have each other. Amen. 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 Grace and peace. 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 Thank you. <laughs>